Hey guys, it's Julesy and I recorded a whole video and the audio was out. So we are gonna give this a second whirlwind, a second try. Mercury is not in microbrave, so I don't know exactly what's trying to go on. Who trying to hate on my time? Girl, I know I don't really post that often on YouTube <laughs> because we be busy. We be working on things, namely this book club. But baby, like when I do sit down to do a video, can you respect me please? Get it together. I wanted to come and talk to you about all the things that I read in 2020 because obviously I'm always talking about the fact that I run a book club, but what are the books that we read? What are my thoughts on those books? Let's come and have a little chat, right? Everyone's not gonna be able to join the book club. Everyone's not gonna have time to keep up with all the readings, but that doesn't mean that I can't come and discuss all these books with everyone. And this is also a great opportunity just to tell you guys what I've been working on because it's like, girl, where have you been? What exactly are you doing? A lot of things. We've been very, very busy. So the SBG book club is welcome to all identities of people. And we are really focused on making reading accessible. That means making it accessible across a diverse range of knowledge bases of different access or entry points to the English language, differently abled people, really doing the work to make reading accessible. You think about how stressful this pandemic has been for folks. Uh, so we have curated uh, Spotify playlists. We have really broken down the readings. We do live discussions to make them more palatable. And we produce syllabi that work as reading guides. This month, we actually have a printed syllabus for uh, Mama's Baby Papa's Maybe an essay by Hortense Spiller that I will be quoting for the next five years. Every time it is that influential, that impactful. Girl, look at all my notes in this daggone essay okay marked up written up i've been doing read-alongs because this is a rather complex text but i've been doing read-alongs on instagram to help folks get through this reading and just you know even if folks only read a paragraph like come on i'm just i just want to like introduce it to you right start somewhere you don't have to like nobody's grading you it's not a classroom but like you know, we were really making these texts more accessible. Last year, we got a grant from the city of Charlotte and we produced a teen syllabus that includes four of the books we read last year, reformatted for a high school audience. You see, we have a, a wholesale pack here. If any teachers wanna purchase this for their school, we have uh, Women of Brewster Place, uh, Home Going by Yaa Jesse, Sula by Toni Morrison, and o Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower with word games and really fun discussion points in here. You know, the syllabi are really meant to not only help make the readings accessible, but like if you wanna go on your own and have your own discussion with your own community, you and your homegirls, you and your friend, you and your family, any of the books we've read, they all have syllabi. You purchase a syllabi and, you know, conduct your own conversation with your own family. You know, you have kids in the house, they bored, get this. Do the syllabus with the kids, okay? You know, help folks read. We talk about reading as if, you know, everybody just finds it super accessible, but like reading is hard because you can read words and not know what the hell you just read. And like, we overly understand it in the book club. So we try to do a lot of work, you know, again, make this reading accessible. On the other side, we have bookmarks that everyone loves. We also have postcards because I know that this pandemic has definitely transformed a lot of our relationships and unfortunately put distance between some of our friendships. And so, and family members like myself, I have not seen my parents in over a year. And so I thought, you know, having postcards that you could send to your friends would just be a really great like little note. So they literally like, let's say beautiful. And then on the other side, friend, you are beautiful, very <laughs> thick postcards and they have jewel toned borders. Ugh. Friend, you are loved. Look at that, yes, okay. Friend, you are needed for everyone who always talking about I forget the men. Here y'all go. Go buy that postcard. Get into it. Then we have friend, you are cared for. This is our most popular one, obviously. I love this one. And then friend, you are needed. Big postcards. You can buy them in a bundle. Buy them individually. Buy them with the bookmarks. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Hood Literary Tees that we have just launched. I know you've seen me in the Toni Morrison one. That's literally my favorite. Damn it, Wesley, who you've seen collab with me in previous videos, designed these shirts. I currently have the Ida B. Wells one on that has a quote from her. One had better die fighting against injustice. Sis, the Hood Literaries. And we also have an RG Lord one. Purchase them on the book club website. I shut down my Shopify 
and migrated everything over to the book club website, but also for the international audience, because again, accessibility, if you would like to get any of the teas, and we also have a mug that says, um, have the confidence of a mediocre white man. <laughs> Love it. It's likely easier and cheaper for you to buy from the YouTube merch shelf that um, sits below my videos. If you do not have your ad blocker on, you should see a merch shelf. So whether you prefer to buy from Spring if you're domestic, but really for the international audience so that you have better access to purchasing the merch and lower shipping costs, <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom, bap, right down below. Man, one of the things that I am most proud, most proud of is in thinking about the accessibility to reading. You know, this pandemic has been very, very stressful. And so we have launched the SBG Literary Kanda Literary, look how beautiful it is. It's not only beautiful, but it smells beautiful oh my gosh mm, this is a full one it's nine ounce soy candle that no label comes on top because i look a little ghetto but uh black woman made and hand poured it literally just smells smells amazing i have one lit here you can see i have actually been using my candle okay it's lavender chamomile and sandalwood are the stars here lull into relaxation brightened with a dash of orange so it's sweet orange, lavender, Roman chamomile, and sandalwood. The scent profile was created by one of my closest friends who I love dearly. If you're over on my Patreon, you've seen my homegirl Leandra several times. That's my woo, that's my bitch. And so this has been from beginning to end, like a black woman collaborative effort. And I'm really proud to be launching this candle. We will be launching um, one scent at a time over the next couple of months. And each scent is is meant to intersect with our readings. So this first candle is rest, resting as an activist practice. So we really wanted to create um, a relaxing, a calming, a cooling experience. So we created these scent profiles with aromatherapy in mind. Like what scents will really like actually relax people, um, give them a moment of like softness, of, of peace, of rest. And so really excited for this candle. Uh, everything, every item that I've mentioned, you can get on the SBG book club store. So it's smartbrowngirl.com slash store. These ship from the candle vendor in Virginia. And we have a very limited number of these, but baby, I'm in love with this candle. I'm just so, so proud, like literally, I'm so like, I've been having really bad anxiety all week, but this candle has been like. Let's get into the books that we read last year. Now, so we have two tracks of reading in the book club. We have the general track, which rotates out every month. It's typically fiction or just lighter, easier reads. We produce syllabi for every read though. And then we have the exploration track, which seeks to make academic readings more accessible. You know, one of the things is I started this book club because I saw so many black intellectuals on Twitter, constantly like making these arguments and quoting these really great texts. And then I would go get the text and I'd be like, I know you lying. Ain't nobody read this itch word for word. This is really difficult text. I know if I'm trying to read these texts on my own and I'm having a hard time and I still have a network of people that I can hit up to discuss the text that I'm reading, what about the people that are like, when I access these readings, can access them because they don't have a uh, school access and they also don't have like a network of people who are in college, right? Like, do you have a bunch of friends that are in PD PhD programs? So we wanted to make this more accessible regardless of your social network, especially if you have an interest in these readings. And even if it's, oh, you only read a paragraph and you don't pick up the text again, you know, you started, you entertained it, you engaged with it in some wavelength. And so that is really what we're after. And so the exploration track, we break down at the speed of the book club. We read it from anywhere from six to 12 weeks. So we started with When Chicken Heads Come Home to Roost on the general track, which is a hip hop feminist breaks it down. It's a really, really, really good text to start with. If you have questions about black feminism, please do not be out here listening to these folks <coughs> who are anti-black feminists trying to tell you about what it is and ain't as they invoke the language of black feminism. I promise you there's not a single black woman alive who has not co-opted the language of a black feminist to make their point. And Joan Morgan really speaks to a lot of the questions that many of us have and the, the uncomfortableness we might have with some of the black feminist texts that we have been introduced to 
and wasn't feeling right it's a great start it was written in the 90s so you know we've definitely evolved there are definitely some what i find to be problematic tones in this book but as reading it as a book club was great because we got to be really honest with how we were feeling and um, you know, why some people were hesitant to call themselves black feminists or why they preferred womanist or why, you know, they wanted to put distance between both. It's, it's, what's important is how do we foster a, a compassionate community where we can have these conversations and really allow people to come into their own politic, but to come into it in an ethical manner where they have had access to the full breadth of text and theory versus like having these arguments on social media in 180 characters. Okay. So on the exploration track side, alongside reading When Chicken Heads Come Home the Roost, we read Anna Julia Cooper's A Voice from the South, which is one of those books that I saw folks quote in and I was like, I know you lying. Cause it was written in 1870 something and it's just antiquated uh syntax right antiquated language uh so a lot of notes i literally circle everything i don't know and then write the definition of it so we read this over two three months and it's a small book and really i wouldn't say i i read this full text i don't think you have to read the whole thing there are like three or four standout essays because it's a collection of essays or speeches she's given um in eight it was written in 1892 and this is considered to be one of the first black feminist texts. So it is actually a really, really important book, but it's antiquated language. And so it might be harder for you to get into. So one, we have the syllabus, two, we did read alongs. Then we did additional videos that just like break down some of the language because sis was shady, right? She had jokes all day long, every day. And it's, if you have a community to break down the text, it makes a lot more sense. Then every February we read uh, Toni Morrison, word to the hood literary Toni shirt. To kick off our first February in the book club, we read Sula by Toni Morrison, which is definitely a book that I kind of struggled with. Not that it was hard to read, but one thing that I've realized, because like I read most of Toni Morrison and like James Baldwin, in middle school, early high school, and I, I read it, but reading it as a teenager and reading it as a adult in my 30s are two totally different experiences. And I think what I struggled with in this book and what, but like my struggle also brought me to a better understanding of Toni Morrison. Toni Morrison does not write good black characters, right? I, and I, what I mean is she does not write black characters that are inherently good people. She's not invested in making people or creating characters who are nice, right? She is invested in characters who are kind and as a much more complicated uh, action. But Tony doesn't write for the white gaze, right? So she writes complex characters who aren't necessarily likable because we've often been trained that black women and black men need to act in a very particular manner in order to be likable. And she pushes back in a very realistic way of like what lives do especially poor black people live that complicate and color their day-to-day -day reality and the decisions that they make. And so it, and it really challenges you to, to reflect to, with your own self, your own community. Um, Sula really talks about black women friendships with your individual identity, black motherhood. Um, also like, yo, the main character in the book, literally because she's a pariah and people look down on her and this like poor black community makes black women in the community better mothers because they despise Sula so much that they want to prove that they're better than her. So they do that by taking care of their children. And then when she dies, they go back to being like un unattentive mothers. It's a wild book, but like, that's how Toni Morrison challenges you. And I'm so grateful we read this in the book club together because I was going through it when we read this and there was somebody in my real life who was who reminded me of some of Sula's ain't shit qualities. So I was like, I despise this book, but I also love it. I love it. Then in March, we read my favorite book, Home Going by Yaa Jesse. It is now one of my favorite books. But when I originally read this book, I was crying on the A train with my sunglasses on. A very touching book. Um, and I love it because yes, it is like a history of how we are interconnected from Africa to the Americas. It's about two half sisters. 
um, from Ghana, one who gets sold into slavery in the United States and one who remains in Ghana. And you see how colonialism, imperialism, and slavery both impacted negatively both sides of the family. This is also in the teen syllabus and this is a good book to read with younger folk. I already love that book, so. That was an easy breezy one for me. I need to remember what we did in order. I might be going slightly out of order here, but we read Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper. And that was one of our first author chats. And this is all a collection of essays. We read this on the general track. And I am so grateful that Dr. Cooper sat down with the book club and gave us our first, our first author chat. You know, it really made possible the opportunity to get some of the other people that we pulled for author chats. Oh man, it was such a good discussion. We don't actually have any social celebrations for, for folks, any adults, unless they're rooted in marriage and children, right? You get graduations and then if you, after graduation, if you don't get married and you don't have kids, unless you throw big birthday bashes, no one ever comes together again to celebrate you in your life. Yeah. Right. And so there is a way that our society is structured to tell you which things have value by telling you which things are worthy of other people stopping their lives, spending their money and inconveniencing themselves to celebrate you. And that's all about marriage and children. So, of course, those are political constructs that we desire because they tell us that we are commencing through life. Approach. This is also a really good follow up to when chicken has come home the roost. Brittany actually wrote the foreword for Joe Morgan's book. Um, and this is a continuation and again, some of the questions, some of the thoughts, especially about like the black women that get access to the academy versus those that don't and some feelings you might have around that, you know, Dr. Cooper gets into all of that. And this was a great read to really push through our own biases that we in ingest as black women that we hold against each other you know again how we also harm each other and working through our own shit right i love it i love it for us we did do a lot of essay books at the beginning of the year we did when chicken has come on the roof sula eloquent rage home going by ya jesse and then we got into on the exploration track black feminist thought which is a thick academic text but we only did oh look at my beautiful original bookmark for the book club love it we did chapters one we did chapters 11 and 12 which was the first part that we read and then we did chapters one and two and if you wanted to go back a lot of people did go back and read other chapters in the book because starting on chapters 11 and 12 makes so much more sense for our modern lives because these definitely these directly speak towards um things that were dealing things that are more apparent now uh, chapter 11 is a black feminist ep epistemology. So how do we even decide who gets to be, who gets to validate the knowledge that exists within society, right? Like what is epistemology and how does that impact black women? And then chapter 12 goes to a politics of empowerment, but she gets into this idea about the domains of power and social hierarchies that constantly replicate oppressive systems for black women. And baby, it was like, yes, sis, yes. Then we went to chapters one and two, politics of black feminist thought, and then distinguishing features of black feminist thought. So really exp like explaining the foundational aspects of a black feminist framework. And then, and then Dr. Patricia Hill Collins joined us for a two hour, baby. I owe her a check. I owe sis a real good, I mean, I did send her a gift, but I owe Dr. Collins something special because that author chat was something amazing. We did not do an author chat with Dr. Collins until like June or July. It was in the summertime because we taking we did these four chapters. We started them at the end of March and we read it through the summer. We really took our time because it just took people a while to warm up to the idea of even investing in this text because it is a thick ass academic book. But like y'all. So we sent all the authors the questions before we do the author chat because we pulled them from our community and we definitely Definitely had questions about femininity and hypergamy, which are huge movements happening on YouTube. And Dr. Collins, who, who is a professor emeritus, emeritus, however you say that word, is a uh, not particularly on YouTube. And so when I sent her the questions, I had to send her some links to the videos that people were referencing. And sis literally stayed, cause like we, we put those hypergamy questions at the very end. Cause I was like, this is YouTube stuff. Let's talk to her about our book. But she was waiting to like, 
at the BS. She was waiting to, she was waiting to correct us, okay? And sis did that. Because I just find this, what a question. That's what I wrote down when, I, when you sent me this question. Marriage is, <clears throat> if you think about marriage as being all about property and wealth, which is what it's been in the US. I mean, marriage is about inheritance. It's about having the right babies to inherit your property. It's about all of that. That's what gender has been all about too, women getting access to men's property as opposed to being their property. And this is a whole system that black women have been outside of because black women were the property initially. And then later on, we're having children who could not be married into the wealth and had to marry black men who were underpaid and who could not provide the wealth. So this whole notion of marrying yourself out of poverty, that is fundamentally an argument that's applied to black poor people now, where you'll hear conservatives say, oh, the problem with black people who are poor is they just all need to get married and have the traditional values that the rest of us have, and then they would be middle class like us. Why would we then take that kind of argument and say to professional black women, maybe you can marry yourself out of working class status by finding yourself a rich man, a black one or a white one, and you know you can't get a black one because the black ones are basically marrying the white ones. So you gotta figure out how to get a white one for yourself if you want it. Why would we go through all of that? It seems like it would be better to start in a whole nother place and say, do you want a happy and fulfilled life? Like, I love Dr. Collins and just being real. Like, that is oh, such a really, really good author chat that we did with her. And we only read four chapters from our book. And we took, like, three months to get through it. But, like, we were really making this just accessible for y'all. We did read a lot of essays. We read Hood Feminism by Mickey Kendall, who also joined us for our author chat. Um, notes from women that a movement forgot. And this is great because... Yeah, we, especially because we do start with these academic texts, we do start with sort of like the black literati of the text, right? And what about people from different socioeconomic backgrounds? What about, we could talk all day about poor black folks, but what about including poor black people, right? And what about including differently abled and queer and trans? And so Mickey Kendall really speaks to the nuances of that, you know, grown, being from the hood and, you know, owning guns and her own relationship with food insecurity and single motherhood and all these things that we might gloss over to have these sort of highbrow conversations but really um, how we need to be thoughtful again, because you know, we cannot fight for our liberation as an exclusive community without fighting for liberation of all black folk. Um, and so Mickey Kendall really brings that home in hood feminism. And that is a book that I see so many people pick up because of the title. It's obviously drawing folks in, but uh, a book that I often see people referencing across Instagram influencers. And I'm always like, we read that in the book club. Hello, hello, hello. Did that in the book club? Yes, we did that. All right, we did get into some fun books. I did a whole girl boss video based off of Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed. If there is one book that I would absolutely positively tell you to don't worry about getting the physical copy, just listen to the audiobook version of it, This it would be this book. The narrator of this book on Audible did that. Okay? Absolutely, positively amazing job. Splendiferous job. Cole Lewis was the narrator of a whole soap opera. All right, got my whole life. And this really challenges some of the ways that you view black women because Amira is a black woman in Philly who is okay with being okay. She's not necessarily a very ambitious character. And I love that for her because why do black women all, not every black woman needs to be hyper ambitious, trying to shoot for the stars in order to be valued. Like some of us just wanna live regular, regular lives. And okay sis, I, you, as you should. I'm missing my copy of Heavy by Kiese Lehman, which we read in August alongside All About Love on the expiration track. August was our most popular month in the book club. We read Heavy, which was our first male author. It is a gorgeous, beautiful, like I've sent copies of the book to all of my male friends. They have all read it and they've all gone to therapy after finishing it because it is just such a good, it's, it's, it's such an honest and raw and gorgeous book. And then we read it with All About Love, which, you know, oh, Bell Hooks basically calls black men terror. <laughs> 
hilarious in this book. But she calls out her own shit about how we all lie, right? And that like lying is violent. You do not love a person if you lie to them. A lot of people like the first three chapters of this book because it's like, yes, justice for children. We all lie because our parents taught us to lie. Some of it gets a little murky in the middle when she's talking about like spirituality or whatever. Community, a loving communion, and then romance and redemption and destiny you know the latter chapters are you know they're they're hard to get through but she's driving home a point right that a lot of the ways we talk about love and partnering um have been ruined by capitalism because we see love as a transactional pursuit and we don't actually think about the emotional wavelength the the full humanity of another person that we are engaging with um because we are both taught very harm we are all taught very harmful traits that we hold on to as we seek to have power and domination over each other so bell hooks calls for a loving ethic and it is it's work and this book challenges you this book will drag your edges i really like this book some people don't i would love to hear why you didn't like it but i'm i'm a fan see all my tabs okay did that hit that heavy i i am remiss to say that our best live discussions have been the ones hosted by men. But um, a black man reading, Jared, one of the funnest collabs I have done. Like that was such a great discussion. And then we had an amazing author chat with Kiese Lehman. So amazing that I low-key want to repost it on my main YouTube channel. But if you haven't checked it out, go watch it. It hits. It does that. It is just, let me just drop a, let me drop a jewel right here, right? Cause that, that was hitting. Yeah. You know, I'm not the defender of black men. Um, but I think, I think we struggle in being honest with ourselves in relationship to women. I'm talking about cis heterosexual men, mm -hmm. but I think the thing about the, the bell hooks quote is like, if you shift the optic, like you could say what she said about black men, about, about parents. Right. Like well, you shift does, the, yeah. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? You shift the optics. So like, I think we have a hard, I think we are fucking terrorists. As she says, despicable. We lie to ourselves, particularly we lie to fucking like black women over and over again. But I think the hardest part is like, at least black women in my life do the same shit. They just don't do it to us. They might do it to a child. They might yeah. do it to a friend. You know what I mean? And we do it like, to each other. Yeah. And definitely do it to each other. I think that's where it gets kind of complicated for me. Mm. Um, we then moved into Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, which Man, there is a Through Lines podcast episode all about Octavia. Sis was ahead of her time. This is so present. This is so, like, the book is set in 2025, and it, it, it feels very real, okay? It is a dystopian sci-fi, but, it like, this and the syllabus that CJ curated for this read just really kind of drive home, like, how this book connects to our very real reality in today's society, and what c lessons can we learn from it? How can we challenge ourselves? How can we think differently about our own situations and, you know, how to prepare ourselves? Parable of the Sour is such a good read and also a really good audiobook. And I know a lot of the folks in the book club who read this book went on to read the other. This is part of a trilogy. So there's two more books in the series and they went on to read those other books and have become really big fans of Octavia Butler. On the exploration track, funny enough, we were reading Parable of the Sower and a big fan of Octavia Butler is Adrian Marie Brown. And so we read a selection of essays from Pleasure Activism, which is about the politics of feeling good. And we also had our I'm in for a author chat that was really cool. She definitely talks about rest, <laughs> about setting boundaries. She talks about love as a transaction and about redefining not only our relationships, but you know, if we're seeking pleasure through others, uh, how are we able to pleasure ourselves? Like, you know, what, what via our own means brings pleasure to ourselves? And how are we investing in that? And how are we taking care of ourselves? And how are we honoring our own bodies? Love love loved that uh queenie queenie was a complicated book i listened to this one on audible as well with sis with a british accent i really wish we could have gotten candace cardi williams um in for an author chat but oh like a lot of complicated feelings about this book people um i think people took issue with the marketing of the book because it was marketed as like a black british jo bridget jones diary and it's a lot of trauma like queenie is a young black girl in the uk 
who is, is, is pl- plush, and I had Brit say it, she's quite a chubby, yeah? And she's dealing with body dysmorphia and valuing herself through her proximity to men that will sleep with her. And so she puts herself in a lot of really uh, violent, almost, sexual experiences with a diverse range of men and so she experiences a lot of what you know as black women we would perceive as traumatic sexual experiences and there is a bit of dark humor I mean it's British humor in the book I listened to the audible audible version of it and didn't mind the book I actually found it enjoyable but a lot of folks in the book club were not keen on Queenie at all and I really wish we could have gotten Candace Cardi Williams to join in. Then we moved into Alice Walker, A Temple of My Familiar. This is one of my favorite books but um, I only read half of it. This is the one book last year I did not finish reading. I forgot how like esoteric this book is like how flowery and metaphoric the beginning of the book is and we read this in November during election season like the height of election season stress girl stress I don't even think we finished the live discussions for this book this was definitely a failing on my part and I love this book the Gospel According to Suge Avery is one of my favorite sections of any book. This is just a bad timing on my part because it's a really thick book. Uh, you know, in November, it was just like we were tired. Uh, I knew that the election was going to be stressful, but I didn't, you know, did I see like this? I mean, I thought I saw, I did see violence coming. I don't know why I picked this, to be honest. Like I knew what I knew and what I knew was not wrong and somehow wrong wrong decision wrong on the other side of that we finished out the exploration track with a selection of essays from in search of our mother's garden also by alice walker now this though this i the in search of our mother's garden like the title essay in this is so thought-provoking this is another book that folks love to quote it's not actually hard to read though but you know, you want to talk about it. Like, what did I just read? What is she saying? Did I get what she's actually saying? Is what she's saying what I think she said? Yeah, so not only did I really enjoy reading this, but I enjoyed uh, the live discussions that we hosted in the book club around this because Alice Walker definitely challenges us to think broader, right? Like, the title essay is talking about how our mothers are artists. And a lot of them have, you know, it's another theme that comes in Toni Morrison, um, how we're like stifled artists. Like how do black women get to express their artistry? The art of survival is one of the highest arts, right? So how do we look back at our black women ancestors and how do we define them for living lives that are typically quite different from ours? Um, and because we have more access and freedom, we might believe that in order for us to have ancestors that we look back upon proudly, they needed to like be these like very like outwardly performing artists. And she's like, no, you have to look deeper. Like, you know, how were they allowed to perform? How were they allowed to exhibit themselves? So look deeper to really and find the value and the beauty of their art. And so we closed out last year, oh, the Don Dada. I I don't know why we could not get Britt Bennett into the book club. She read my IGDMs. The, her her publisher, her publishing team, like whatever. We tried, we tried, we tried to get her in December. We tried to get her in January. We tried to get this in March of this year. Couldn't land it. Could not land it. And it's like she read my IGDM. She did some collabs with other black bookstagrammers, but just wasn't responding to us. So I don't, I don't know. But the book is good. Like I can't, you know what I mean? Like the book is so damn good. I do feel some type of way because since I just want to talk to you about how brilliant you were in writing The Vanishing Half. Also a book I listened to on Audible. This is also a soap opera. I was literally finding reasons to drive places because the book was that. Good. I cannot wait to see this as a movie. I believe Issa Rae bought the option for it. Very excited to get into this. If, if you have not read it, go back and read this. You can do the audiobook or you can get the physical copy of it. I might just go back and read it for the fun of it. It was that good. Got my whole life. Enjoyed it. It is about twin sisters. One passes. One stays in Louisiana and ends up having a dark daughter, dark skinned daughter. The other one has a daughter who is essentially white and it's crazy. Loved it. Loved every, like, did that. Chef's kiss. 
see. What would be my my least favorite read of last year? It would unfortunately be A Temple of Mind Familiar by Alice Walker. And then my favorite, favorite read of last year, Black Feminist Thought, really. Like, that author chat just lands so, so well for me. But also, like, A Vanishing Half was just a good escape, right? We definitely tried to mix up, you know, giving books that help you expand your thoughts, expand your intelligence, expand the knowledge and intellect that lives within every last one of our community members. But also like sometimes you just want to read a book that's easy breezy and fun to read that adds a bit of drama and spice to your life without like chaos because this was a very chaotic year. And so finishing off the year with The Vanishing Half was just the perfect, perfect book. I love it and I hope that y'all enjoy it too. If you have not, because this, this video probably won't get a whole lot of views. I mean, come on. Just talking about books here. But grab your candle and support the SBG Book Club. My birthday is March 25th and all I want is donations or, you know, free to purchase the product from us. That's great, thanks. They're doing a lot of work. And so I appreciate you and I hope you at least enjoyed hearing me talk about all these books. Let me know below. If you read along with the book club, what was your favorite read and what was your least favorite read? Like, what did you start? You was like, oh, girl, I can't do this. I'm going to put this ish down. And even if you didn't read along with us, what has been your overall favorite read and what has been a book that you were absolutely like, Oof, this book is a mess. Not interested. Never again. Let me know in the comments down below and I will see y'all on the other side. Bye.